You're listening to the LA Football Podcast. What's going on, Los Angeles? Welcome to the LA Football Show here on the LA Football Network, your destination for Los Angeles football. This is your Trojans huddle, USC football segment on the LA Football Show. Excited to get into some big news concerning our Trojans just because the season is over does not mean the coverage stops at the LA Football Network. So can't wait to get into it. But first, our next partner has a product that I use literally every day. I'm not a healthy person, or at least I wasn't, and still I started taking AG1 by Athletic Greens. I don't like waking up early, not a morning person, not a breakfast person not a vitamin person, but Athletic Greens makes it easy for me to get everything I need to start my day right. It's one scoop of AG1. You're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source ingredients, probiotics, and adaptogens to start my day right. It's going to help your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, aging, everything you need to be healthy and you can do it with one scoop. So right now, it's time to reclaim your health, arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. As I said, it's just is going to give you a free, and that's free, one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash L-A-F-B. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash LAFB to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, from UCLA talk to the hated rival across town, USC. We love them both. You attended both. So obviously there's a love there. I attended both in terms of a fan of football games because Long Beach State had no football. But we can transfer over and talk a little offseason USC. And there's a lot to get into with USC, Jamal. A ton to get into. I mean, for being an offseason and early on offseason, obviously the transfer portal is big. Obviously, the coaching regime, some stuff is going on. But I want to start with um, talking about a USC legend, a great. And uh, Charles White passed away just on Wednesday of a battle with cancer, only 64 years old. And, you know, obviously we, we, we don't want to take anything away from him as a human being and what he, what his life was, but we'll keep this more football talk wise. Jamal, you could argue the greatest Trojan of all time. I mean, he's up there. I know everyone immediately goes to Marcus Allen football wise, OJ Simpson, Reggie Bush, Matt Leiner, Charles White, I don't know if it's just because of an older era or just gets less talk, not as flashy. I don't know. But when you look at what he did in a Trojan uniform, there is an absolute argument to be made that he is the greatest Trojan of all time. Ryan, not only is there an argument, there's easily an argument. And and when you look at Charles White, 6,743 yards rushing, he's still the Trojans all-time leading rusher, two-time All-American, two-time Rose Bowl MVP, 1978 uh, Heisman Trophy winner, 1979 national champion, and, you know, two-time All-American. I mean, the resume is just unparalleled, speaks for itself. Really, when you look at totality of resume, Ryan, only Matt Leinert's resume compares. When you talk about national champion with uh, Heisman Trophy, with multiple Rose Bowls, multiple Rose Bowl MVPs, multiple All-American honors. And so Charles White, and I think you hit the nail on the head. He wasn't as fast as OJ Simpson. He wasn't quite as flamboyant or runner as Marcus Allen. He was the thumper, as John Robinson called, the most physical running back he had ever seen during his time at USC. And his place will forever be etched in USC lore. And he lives on through his family and we'll really deeply miss him as, as one of the true greats of the Trojan family. And I'm so happy, Ryan, that towards the end of his career, there was a mending of relationship 
between Charles White and USC. The, the school and, and White had become estranged a little bit. White battled substance abuse for a little bit, given all of the hits. A lot of a realization came at the end of his career that just the, the constant trauma to the head led to some neurological impairment that, that led him down a difficult road. And so I'm just so happy that that relationship was able to mend between university and, and Charles White. He'll forever be on the pantheon of great Trojans. May his soul rest in peace. May he continue to fight on in heaven. And you're talking about one of the true legends of not just USC history, not just college football history, but of football history. Yeah, absolutely. And just, just to piggyback on football history, you know, had a eight year NFL career started with the Brown. I mean, how many great running backs that the Browns had over their history and, you know, Charles white, I don't, it's hard to say this now, but didn't probably live up to the hype of his college days with the Browns. But then he comes back to the Rams, Jamal and finishes his career in LA where he belongs and finishes the right way because his second to last season has an all pro season with over 1300 yards, 11 touchdowns and goes out the right way in terms of, you know, football as a running back. And so Jamal, here's a guy that we've done before uh, the Mount Rushmore of LA football. A lot of people talk about the LA greats in terms of sports in general, but obviously we focus on football I don't think it gets mentioned enough. Charles White is a guy that absolutely deserves to be definitely in the conversation on the Mount Rushmore. You meant we mentioned everything with the Trojans, how he arguably is the greatest Trojan of all time, not just running back, but Trojan of all time. And then you add in the fact that he had an all pro season with the LA Rams. I think, uh, I don't know if disrespect's the right word, but definitely a guy that isn't getting respected enough in terms of LA sports. So RAP Charles White, you said it best fight on in heaven and uh, we couldn't be more thrilled to be at least associated in the annals of L.A. football, considering we cover the sport. You were so great at it. And so big thanks to, to Charles White and uh, thoughts and condolences, obviously, to his family and everything like that. So, um, but yeah, so lost to legend. But in that, let's move on now, Jamal, to some new potential legends with the Trojans. But before we get into the new potential legends we got to talk about the big news that alex grinch is going to be back as the defensive coordinator for your usc trojans you thought this all along basically um i agree with you but you put it out there that if this this didn't happen in the first 24 to 48 hours the writing was on the wall obviously it didn't it's now been confirmed that he will be back we can dive into it but your initial thoughts on alex grinch officially being the defensive coordinator again for the Trojans. Yeah, Ryan, it was what I expected. And, you know, you talked about the what I said earlier about the 24 to 48. And there's another factor here. And it, it comes down to power dynamic. When you pay Lincoln Riley $100 million a year, the power dynamic, $100 million in totality, $10 million a year, excuse me, the power dynamic lies with Lincoln Riley. And so even if you're Mike Bone, athletic director, you have to really pick your spots about when you can be strong in a recommendation to Lincoln Riley. And really, it can only happen one or two times over a six to seven year period. You only have two bullets to use. And I and the argument there is, after year one, are you willing as the AD to burn one of those two bullets to really kind of lay the hammer down on Lincoln Riley? Or is he still early enough in his tenure? Is he still basking in the honeymoon period of his tenure, going from four and eight, to 11 and three, where you give him the benefit of the doubt one more year in terms of his judgment for his very good friend. Now, I'll argue that if this same situation plays out and USC flames out at the end of the season, courtesy of the defense, then if you're Mike Bone after a year two, you have to go to Lincoln Riley and say, look, it's time to make a DC change. But I think timing is the thing that benefits Alex Grinch the most here given where Lincoln Riley is in his USC tenure, but it really feels now like it's do or die for Alex Grinch in the 2023 season. He's really going to need to put a strong performance out there with this defensive unit for this fan base, for this administration, for the boosters to have long-term faith in him moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if I can be the, I guess, 
glass half full guy or put a, a try to put a positive spin, which is hard based on how this defensive performance was all year long. But if we want to be, I don't even know if realistic is the right word, but just um, cognizant and kind, if you will, this coaching staff comes in, you know, just a little over a year ago. And obviously we saw an offense that it didn't take long to implement exactly what Lincoln Riley wanted to do. But you also have the greatest quarterback in the country helping to orchestrate that. On defense, they got some good transfers in. They had some playmakers there before, but it's still a whole new install. There's still pieces that didn't quite fit the scheme, you know, square pegs and round holes. And I, I, again, I'm not saying this is excuses. I'm not saying this is why they retained him. But if you try to put a positive spin on it, you would think now going after guys more that fit. We talked about Jamil Muhammad. We talked about the kid out of Oklahoma State. These linebackers that are more athletically inclined backers that can be more physical and play this system better. You would think there'd be improvement there. And as we said all along, it's not like this defense obviously would be great if it can be a Nick Saban, a Kirby smart style defense, it's never going to be, and it doesn't have to be, you would just have to be competent. You have to be able to tackle. You have to be able to make four to five stops a game. And you have to not give up big, big plays every single, not just game, every single freaking possession. It felt like. So going into year two, those are the expectations. Now is now you've had another full off season to kind of get more players that fit. You can implement better tackling tactics and whatnot. And you've had a full year to get your system and scheme and buy in by your players that are coming back that we should see that true improvement. And I agree with you. If it doesn't happen in year two, if it doesn't happen by week six, even well, okay, let's not say that because this is still a team with aspirations of a championship, but if it doesn't happen for sure this year, then I think we'll definitely see them shake up the the coaching staff at that point. Yeah, Ryan, and I think you said it best with kind of getting more of a roster of their type of athlete. And SC, you mentioned it, Jamil Muhammad now coming into the linebacking crew. Now look at that linebacker room. Obviously, you've got Gentry, you've got Shane Lee, you've got Jamil Muhammad, but you also have uh, Ray's John Davis is, you know, a part of that crew now at, at the linebacker position. So lots of excitement there. Then when you look at, and then, of course, Mason Cobb, who was the aforementioned kid from Oklahoma State. So now you've got that quintet at the linebacker position. You look at defensive line, you lose Tui Tui Pelotu. You use, you lose Brandon Pilly. But now where do you come and replace? You bring in a Jack Sullivan from uh, the likes of Purdue and, you know, another Purdue kid. UCLA got the kid at the offensive line. SC gets the kid at the defensive line with Jack Sullivan. 86 career tackles, nine and a half career sacks, one pass breakup, uh, seven pass breakups and one forced fumble. So a prolific guy at the defensive line spot that hopefully can do more things. And then the big prize, Ryan, was Anthony Lucas, the five-star kid from Texas A&M who played one year at Texas A&M very sparingly, only had 10 total tackles the whole season. But this is a five-star athlete. So now when you put Lucas together with Sullivan, now you're starting to get more variety. Now you're starting to get more athleticism. And let's hope that translates for Alex Grinch in terms of just getting this team to be credible. Because the challenge that Alex Grinch is facing now, Ryan, is the narrative that is associated with Lincoln Riley. Lincoln mm-hmm. Riley is one in four in New Year's six games. But his four quarterbacks in the four losses were Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, Jalen Hurts and Caleb Williams. That's three Heisman winners and a Heisman runner up. And he lost all four of those games. So the first thing you're going to think of is what was going on on the defensive side of the ball in those games. And Alex Grinch is the common denominator, whether you're talking about Oklahoma or you're talking about USC. So this is really kind of a put up or shut up year for Grinch. They've gotten off to a great start with Sullivan and Lucas at the defensive line spot. Now they have a quintet of linebackers that feels more like them. But again, you're losing to Ipolotu. You're losing Pilly. You're losing Figaro on the line. You're losing Makai Blackman in the secondary. So there's still some losses here. So work to be done for Grinch. I think they're not done in the portal in terms of getting the depth. Lincoln Riley said it, that the defensive line is going to be the unit that is going to have the greatest turnover of any single unit 
from 2022 to 2023. And so very excited to see, in the words of Kobe Bryant, the job's not finished for USC in terms of transfer portal. Yeah, I want to – I don't want my words twisted because I love Lincoln Riley. He was the best hire for this job. He's a phenomenal coach, and I have very high hopes and things to come for this program. But when we go back to what we talked about on our Chargers show, how offensive coaches seem to have a lot, much longer leash than defensive-minded coaches, yeah. and this is a perfect example. Lincoln Riley, considered, and rightfully so, but considered a top-five coach in all of college, and you just mentioned it, one in four in, in, in uh, New Year's mm -hmm. six games, and all of those are because of the poorest defenses. And if that was a defensive coach with the opposite, having poorest offenses – He'd be canned because they're saying, why aren't you fixing the offense? So it is very interesting how that rope works from one side of the ball to the other. So agree with everything, Jamal. Let's talk quickly before we wrap up about guys leaving. And we were talking earlier kind of in the group chat, LFP group chat about what this offense looks like. And I'm not concerned about the offense considering it's Lincoln Riley, considering you have Caleb Williams, but they are losing some very – Big pieces. Obviously, Travis Dye was injured last year, but he's he's going, gone, going to the NFL. Kyle Ford just announced he's transferring, who is your big, different style of receiver. We love Kyle Ford. Really bummed to see that. Gary Bryant obviously didn't play at all really much last year, but still a formidable receiver who's transferring. And obviously, Jordan Addison going to the draft. So, you know, just a couple minutes. We can't spend a ton of time, but are you concerned about the offense or more of just less – optimistic as you were before and just need to see it actually come to fruition. I am concerned about the offense in this way, Ryan, that I'm not concerned at all about the explosiveness. When you look at the receiver room and you see Rice and Washington and Dorian Singer and Mario Williams, and then the two studs who are the freshmen, uh, Branch and Makai Lemon, I mean, that six deep is just a joke. And then when you look at, obviously, Austin Jones, and then they got Marshawn Lloyd, the kid, the running back out of South Carolina, who last year had 111 carries, 573 yards, nine touchdowns, to be that combo guy with Jones. I'm not at all concerned with the explosiveness. Where I'm concerned a little bit is versatility. Because you could argue that USC is losing their three most versatile weapons from last year. When you talk about their best route runner and their most NFL-ready receiver in Jordan Addison, who I still don't believe any of those guys I mentioned are as good as Jordan Addison, any of those six right now. Then when you talk about what Travis Dye gave you, not only running the ball, but receiving the ball out of the backfield. And then and when you talk about Cal Ford being that different type of receiver, that big receiver, the kid that could do so many different things. I go back to that UCLA game, and it was evident that Jordan Addison and Kyle Ford were the two best receivers on the field that night. And so now Lincoln Riley is clearly leaning in to everything that is the air raid. And it's going to be the same type of receiver in terms of these smaller, twitchier guys with great speed who are going to blow the top off of defenses and guys that are maybe 6'1", 6'2". So I worry a little bit, not they're still going to be 40, 45 a game easily, but I worry a little bit about the versatility. And when you have to play a Washington this year and you have to play an Oregon this year, and oh, by the way, you got to play Notre Dame this year with Hartman, the transfer from Wake Forest, without that versatility, is that going to be enough to get you over the top? So as crazy as it sounds, I am a little concerned about the offense. Yeah, and you get Utah again with Cam Rising returning, which uh, I know USC fans didn't want to hear that, but that just makes the matchup that much more fun and juicy. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not concerned, but yeah, definitely it's there's some questions there, and and the versatility is a big thing, and and I don't think it is in terms of statistics and points, maybe not, but when you look at mono e mono and some of those big moments, who do you have that can step up in those big moments? We shall see. And we have all off season to get into it. So that is all the time we have on the LA football show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure to like, and subscribe to the show, wherever you get your podcasts on YouTube and on the website, lafbnetwork.com for Jamal Madney. I'm Ryan Dyrud. Everyone have a blessed weekend. We'll talk to you all next week. You're listening to the LA Football Podcast.